Hello, everyone. You're all very welcome to, to UCD in Conversation. My name is Tasman Crow, and I'm the director of the UCD Earth Institute, which is UCD's Institute for Environmental and Sustainability Research. This series reflects UCD's rising to the future strategy and its four pillars, which are creating a global, a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering humanity. Today's webinar will be roughly 45 minutes long, and it will include a Q&A at the end. So please submit your questions at any time during the conversation using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Today's episode, and indeed the next three in conversation episodes as well, will focus specifically on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, exploring in particular where we are to date in terms of achieving the SDGs, progress made to date on climate action, the role of business in a sustainable future, and issues around food supply and shortages. The 17 SDGs, also known as the Global Goals, were adopted by all 193 member states of the United Nations as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and to create a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. Through the Rising to the Future strategy, UCD embeds the SDGs across its education, research, governance, and engagement activities. This episode, in collaboration with UCD Alumni Relations, picks up from the UCD SDG seminar series, which the Earth Institute hosted in 2019 and 2020, and brought together academics, alumni, and stakeholders to explore the research needs for addressing each of the goals. And you can actually find the link for the records of these in the chat. So now I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Orla Kelly, who will lead a conversation on achieving the sustainable development goals and introduce us to our expert panelists who both played important roles in the development of the goals. Paula herself is an assistant professor in social policy at the UCD School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice. She specializes in studying sustainable human well-being, eco-social policy, sustainable development, and the social dimensions of climate change. And in 2020, Ola received funding from the World University Network to lead an international consortium of academics working at the intersection of education and climate change. So over to you, Ola. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tasman, for that introduction. And thank you to the UCD Earth Institute um, and UCD Alumni Relations for facilitating this. Um, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. Um, so we, as Tasman mentioned, we are kind of setting the scene today, if you will, for broader conversations that we're going to be having kind of more deep dives into um, specific themes in relation to the sustainable development agenda. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a quick bio of our two distinguished speakers, um, and then we're going to dive right in and we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for um questions and answers from you all as well at the end. So if you have questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A section um, and we look forward to engaging um, on that front as well. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we'll start, I'll start by introducing our speakers. So um, David Donahue is a graduate of UCD. He holds honorary doctorates from UCD and NUI Galway. He was Ireland's permanent representative to um, the United Nations from 2013 to 2017. Very important period. Um, in 2015, he co-facilitated with his Kenyan colleagues, the UN negotiations, which agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, um, which we'll kind of refer to as Agenda 2030 throughout, um, just for everybody's reference. Um, in 2016, he co-facilitated with his Jordanian colleagues the negotiations which produced the New York Declaration on Large Movements of Migrants and Refugees. As an Irish diplomat, he's had a long involvement with the Northern Ireland peace process and was a member of the Irish government team, which negotiated the Good Friday Agreement. And today he's working with various think tanks and academic communities on the implementation of the SDGs, migration, refugee issues and conflict re resolution. Um, our other distinguished speaker is uh, Professor Patrick Paul Walsh. Uh, he's currently a full professor of international development studies and a member of the governing authority at University College Dublin. Uh, Professor Walsh is the director of the UCD Centre for Sustainable Development Studies, the director of the MSc in Sustainable Development in partnership with UNSDSN 
a coordinator of the UCD PhD in global human development, which trains academic staff in East African universities up to the PhD level. Um, and he's a special advisor to the UNSDSN New York. Um, he received his PhD in economics from LSE um, and is a Government of Ireland, Marie Curie, ISEA, RSA, and REPOA Fellow. So two wonderful guests that we have today. Um, so I'm going to get started. You both were involved in um, the kind of process that led up to this, this uh, Agenda 2030. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, David. Um, you know, we look at these goals as kind of an, an outcome, you know, the final product of what I'm sure was a very long and complicated um, and process, but a very important one. So I guess I'll start with uh, why are the goals so important? You know, we, we've most of us, if not all of us, have heard of the SDGs. So, um, you know, maybe a little overview of what they are, why they are important. Mm. And then given your involvement, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit kind of from behind the curtain, um, you know, what, what some of the, the maybe social or political context that allowed uh, nation states to, to agree, you know, 193 nation states to agree on such a huge number of goals and targets of, over such um, far-reaching issues. Sure, Orla. Well, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I'll try and keep my remarks brief. Um, basically, for those who are not absolutely familiar with the SDGs, they're kind of a blueprint for the development of humanity, basically, and of our planet. There's not much which is not covered by the SDGs. Let, let's put it like that. Almost literally everything under the sun. Uh, there are 17 goals, um, uh, there might be, say, one on health and one on energy and one on water and one on food security and so on. And under each goal, you have maybe seven t six or seven sub-goals. They're actually called targets, but they would be more detailed aspects of each goal. So it is uh, it's quite a, an elaborate framework. Um, it, perhaps the key point to make is there was an earlier set of goals called the Millennium Development Goals. And they were only eight in number, and they focused heavily on uh, poverty uh, reduction. In the meantime, after those goals were adopted, which is around 2000, the view took hold that you needed to take a broader approach, which would uh, recognize that you need to tackle in parallel poverty reduction, um, environmental protection, and uh, uh, ensuring balanced economic growth. So there were therefore three dimensions that had to be captured and sort of addressed in a holistic way, namely the economic, the social, and the environmental. And that concept is known as sustainable development. So there was a strong view that the world needed to have a new set of goals for the period 2015 to 2030, which would look at those issues uh, holistically and, and uh, focus on the interconnections between all of them. Um, so my role as the Irish ambassador to the UN was that I was asked to co-chair in effect. I mean, the word co-facilitate is UN language, but I, I was asked to co-chair the negotiations with the ambassador of Kenya. Why, why was Ireland asked? Well, it's partly because we have a good reputation in the area of development cooperation generally. It's also because we're seen as an honest broker. We don't come with particular baggage on any of those issues. Um, I have to say an extra element, uh, which they perhaps didn't intend, was that uh, you know I'm a native speaker of English, which meant that I was able to draft reasonably fluently in English, which is de facto the, the language, and therefore I ended up doing a lot of the drafting um, of the entire package, while my colleague was tic-tacking with the group of 77 developing countries and so on. So between us, we had the job of actually getting the agreement of all 193 countries, which meant that we had to produce successive drafts of the document uh, and, and, and go into corners and uh, try to cajole and persuade and, and uh, harass um, all the, the hundreds of delegates until the point where they gave up and said, OK, we, we surrender and we will agree them. And that happy uh, moment was reached on the 2nd of August 2015. How did we, we get there, Order, sort of moving to your, to your second question? Well, we were fortunate, to be honest, that in those days, um, the world, A, was convinced of the need for a broader set of development goals. Um, there were few countries who were arguing against it. B, we had people like Obama in the White House, uh, who, you know, there were still relatively progressive leaders um, who were willing to support the SDGs. And I should say that China 
uh, has always been very supportive to, to pick uh, another one. But in the year 2015, we just were lucky that we had um, a kind of a consensus which had already been shaping over the previous few years, assisted, by the way, by a huge UN process which brought in civil society, asking worldwide what kind of new goals do we want for ourselves? So myself and my colleague had to actually um, uh, just work on the delegates. We produced, as I say, individual drafts. And finally, uh, we, we got there. Uh, uh, we needed some luck as well, <laughs> I don't mind admitting. But we managed, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we actually got there with no reservations on the part of any country, which is important. No country was opting out. Uh, and we got it done on schedule and we got it done on our own without any external uh, um, uh, intervention. So I think I leave it at that order because I know yeah. you want to get on to others. There's a lot more that I would like to say and, and, and we'll get to, but for now that's, um, that gives you, I hope, a flavour. Yeah, absolutely. A flavour of what sounds like a, a very... Um, are complicated um, process, but but one that there was a great <laughs> outcome from um, and uh, a success story, if you will. And, and, and it's heartening to hear about Ireland's role in, in achieving that. Um, Paul, I'll turn to you. Um, so we, if we look at 2015 and the, the adoption without reservation by all 193 countries, these, um, these 17 goals and associated targets, um, it was a fantastic framework. Um, and the, the goals are by design, you know, the MDGs focused on extreme poverty, but by design, the SDGs have these kind of three domains of the economic, social and environmental. And, and the explicit focus on the environmental is, is some, somewhat of a departure from from, from previous international um, development strategies. Um, at the same time, we have this ongoing parallel process, if you will, of, of the kind of conference of parties. So, you know, we will have all heard on the news COP26 happened in Glasgow this year, where we're trying to kind of get countries, um, you know, to, to get concrete goals in terms of specific environmental targets and in particular um, emissions reductions. Do you, I mean, it could be argued that we haven't done enough to piggyback on the STG agenda and, and kind of have not have these kind of um, this bifurcation in these kind of two two realms of, of international multilateral agreements. Um, would you agree with that? You know, do you think um, do you think it's a problem that that do you think we could have done better about kind of knitting together um, ongoing environmental um, agreements with the SDG agenda and um, maybe not? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, um, it's, a, it's a very good question and it's it's been it's on our mind at the moment. Um, so just just before I, I address that, um, I, I would like to say, um, you know, uh, like Ireland is a young country and we we had a uh, Noel Dorr, for example, I think we used to be graduate as well, who chaired the Security Council all those years ago. And then with uh, David Donoghue, um, really co-facilitating, co-chairing um, the intergovernmental negotiations on what has become Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And I get, that was just really a big moment for Ireland. Um, and the other thing, uh, I think David is very modest in the sense that what came in, certainly there was work programs that came into those negotiations, a census report from the General Secretary put all that together. But, and David did have the outcomes of, you know, the goals and targets basically from the Open Working Group. Um, but that whole document, you know, from preamble um, to the means of implementation, the follow-up and review process, um, that basically was, uh, was written by David and everyone knew it. And, uh, you know, it was just so skillfully written. It's a beautifully written document. And, and, and it's, it's, it's more than that because his team, uh, so we had a, a student in there, I don't know, Jan, you remember Jan Spalan was, was with you over that period and mm -hmm. stuff. So um, we had some a UCD student uh, working away. Um, so uh, we had some insights into really the hard work that was going on behind the scenes and understanding, you know, troubleshooting what was going on with the different nations. but. The, the ability to be able to write with such clarity and to avoid any sort of misinterpretation or misunderstandings. Um, that was all David Donoghue. Um, and it's great. I mean, he, he did do a, a, he's a, a degree of literature in UCD. So that's, that's, that, that's, that came to, to the fore. Um, but to have no reservations August 2nd, 
everyone, 193 nations without reservations signing up to this was, was quite remarkable because I was actually at the time also following what was going on for the finance development run. And honestly, they were putting up the paragraphs of the thing and arguing over words and none of this was going on uh, in, in, in the, in the under Kamau and David Donahue, none of that was going on. So I think that was, it's, it's really, everyone should read the, the document actually. And people know the goals, but people should read the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, no, sorry, so your question. Um, in one of our global classrooms that we run with SDSN, we had a Paolo, Paula, our, our, our Paula Caballero, um, who I think was a probably a, a Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Colombia in Rio plus 20. And Colombia as a country were the ones, I don't know whether it's true or not, but they certainly seem to be credited with this idea of beating the drum. Look, we want to integrate the environment agenda with the socioeconomic agenda. It has to be done. And what's good about this is that it kind of came from the developing world, mm. right? Because particularly South America, where maybe your, your social, economic and political context is more with nature and you, and you live with nature more and more conscious of nature. Um, and this was not something that easy because a lot of the developed world knew, knew well that it was causing carbon emissions, that it was not doing great for ocean health or land use. So when you bring a, a, an agenda like this that's universal, that every country, including the rich countries, had to sign up to, and then as, as David made sure in the document that it's an indivisible or very integrated agenda, that like in a nutshell, when you're doing economic policies, for example, you've got to think about the economic and the environmental consequences of what you're doing. And not just at home, but globally, right? And you also have to think of the political pathways and the governance that you need to actually bring this to be, right? So it's very much on the four pillars of sustainable development the economic, the societal, uh, the governance and the environmental and bringing them together. Okay, so, uh, and this is, this is it's, it's just a very simple agenda really that no one should really be benefiting uh, politically or any way from harming other people at home or abroad or harming nature. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, a very simple type of principle that's driving uh, this, this agenda. Right. Now, to answer your question, though, um, I think Paula Correct, she has a new book coming out and she kind of makes this point about, you know, it's not to, it's not easy to fix this. Right. Mm -hmm. But we do have we had the COP26, which is the run for we know for environment. But we also had the COP15, which met, I think, in September, October, September, and we'll meet again next April, which is the biodiversity goals, which have been renegotiated because they were 2020, actually, if you look at the targets. Right. Um, and she did think that it's a little bit of a pity um, that somehow when people are coming together to talk about pathways to climate neutrality or pathways to biodiversity restoration, that somehow it's a bit outside of the, the HLPF, you know, or outside, the, say, the review of the Sustainable Development Goals that's done by the High Level Political Forum every year and the subcommittees of that body during the year, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just in short, where does it, like some people say, and David was saying before that, you know, Eamon Ryan goes, look, we have a climate action plan and uh, we put it in place. And in all honesty, every climate action plan, it doesn't matter whether it's China to 2060 or us to 2050, it all involves energy transition. It involves, you know, infrastructure transitions. It involves uh, sectors, you know, like particular sectors like agriculture, construction, data, et cetera, transitions, right? And in a sense, to actually implement, get those carbon reductions down, you've got to implement the SDGs. So in some ways, they're the same agenda, right? But the only thing I would say is that that might be kind of true if you're comparing what I call a voluntary national review to an NDC, you know, these national determined contributions at a national mm -hmm. level. The problem is, though, is that most of the admissions that come, say, from transportation are interstate, you know, boats, Going, you know, going across the water. Most of the transmit trans you know, problems with goods and services, we know they're from global value chains. They're not just within one state. Even with energy, people export and import different types of energy, right? So the point is, is there's interstate linkages. Um, Taz, I think uh, people put up this thing about the one ocean. 
that when we pollute in our oceans here, it travels and it hits all the coastlines of every country in the world. We are completely interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is, is that the SDGs emphasizes global partnerships and capacities and global partnerships because there has to be multilateralism. Countries have to get together for ocean health, for biodiversity, for climate change, to control and regulate uh, all the sort of products and services, et cetera. And we're seeing this with the vaccines. I think people are getting yeah. a good feel for this with, with the vaccines, right? Um, so what I would say is that I think it is a bit of a problem uh, that the biodiversity, the COPs, are outside the SDGs. DGs, yeah, uh, yeah. And not just on timelines, because obviously one is 2030, the other ones are going out to 2050. So uh, so I think there's a, there's a slight problem, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Um, I'm struck by with both your answers, the kind of the underlying current here is, is, is this notion of connectedness, right? That in order to get to this uh, agreement that we got in 2015, it was a sense of a connectedness of, of a shared value, a shared vision for the future, the need for economic, social and environmental change. And, and then when we get down to the nitty gritty of how nation states have, have tried at a multilateral level to achieve that, you know, we have the SDGs and the review processes associated with that. And now we have these COP processes. But, um, but as, as you rightly said, you know, nobody should be targeting in one country, you know, from something that's harmful in another um, and you know a ton of carbon here is the same as a ton of carbon in China so this this need for for connectedness both in terms of how we see our place in the world and our place within with each other in terms of nation stages is, is key um, unfortunately I will say not uh, after um, the the rise of COVID-19 has made this more complicated in more ways than one so, for example, um, you know, we know that the, the, the problems, uh, the fallout, the continued fallout of the pandemic means that many, much of the progress we made on some of the goals has been undermined somewhat. You know, more people falling um, at risk of hunger, higher rates of extreme poverty, um, gender based violence, gender inequality rising, you know, inequality within and between nations on the rise. Um, so, so, A, I guess um, my question to you, David, would be, um, and, and then I'll go to you, Paul, it's twofold. First, um, how do we, how is, is the 2030 agenda achievable given what's happened with the pandemic in terms of targets and B, the other long-term impact? You know, we've seen a rise of vaccine nationalism. There is a lot of inequality in terms of how we're rolling out access to vaccines. Um, and, and it's hard to not believe that that's not going to undermine some of the international goodwill and political um, kind of relations that, that we rely on for such multinational agreements. So, so kind of both in the both a practical level and, and the kind of relationship level how do you see the impact of COVID-19? Uh, thanks Ora yeah uh, well I have to say when COVID-19 first struck I thought that this is going to be a really serious setback in terms of the whole project of the SDGs uh, but then I, I gradually realized that in fact no it is an enormous opportunity for the SDGs it mightn't seem like that uh, offhand but it's because countries realized that they are deeply interconnected with, with each other, as, as you were saying. So far from the, uh, and, and perhaps more importantly, they realize that they need to um, uh, make enormous progress, say, on their health system, uh, on, on digital connectedness, on uh, social protection. So a number of the things which are addressed by the SDGs suddenly loomed much larger because of the impact of the pandemic. So in, in many ways, we're trying to rebuild the world with or after, ideally, um, the, the pandemic. The SDGs is the way to do that. Uh, that may seem impossibly idealistic, but but it is the way, for example, the UN Secretary General is presenting it. Build back better is the theme. So the SDGs, far from being less relevant, are now more relevant than ever before. In making new economies, new societies, we have to do it on the basis of sustainability, uh, and that is the 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 the, the, the motto. And all governments in the world, believe it or not, agree with that because it is reflected in the, there's a thing called the High Level Political Forum, uh, which meets at the UN every year to assess progress on the SDGs. And they're making clear that the measures they're taking to combat COVID 
in effect are part of their implementation of the SDGs. So as Paul was saying, in, in effect, these are two agendas which flow into one. Now, of course, there is the enormous problem of resources. Countries might be intellectually convinced of the relevance of the SDGs, but if they are uh, suddenly experiencing uh, um, a very poor negative, a very poor economic performance, uh, if investment is drying up because of COVID, uh, I mean, it will take a bit longer. Uh, so in the resources is certainly a complication. Take a few years to recover from that. Um, and climate is... a, a as Paul was saying, it's a complementary issue. Um, we have one of the 17 SDGs is about climate. We, we already agreed that on the as an insurance policy against the possibility that there would be no Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, in fact, followed three months later. But uh, um, somebody like Mary Robinson, for example, who is very active on both fronts, climate and SDGs. She would feel that the two belong together, and I, I very much agree with that as well. Uh, we always intended that sustainable development could be achieved only in parallel with, with climate. So, in effect, what countries are doing now to um, implement the SDGs, to implement the Paris Agreement, and to combat COVID is ultimately a single uh, agenda. As to when it might be achieved, well, this may sound like heresy, but um, 2030, of course, is the period by which every country in the world is meant to have achieved every goal and target. Something tells me it won't quite work, work out. However, even if we make some distance, get some distance down the road, uh, there'll be a, a, a balance left to be achieved. That will simply be rolled over into the next set of goals. How do I know that? Because we did that in framing the SDGs. There was the unfinished business from the Millennium Development Goals, a uh, considerable amount, in fact, and that was folded over into the new set of goals. So realistically, I think what will happen is that around about 2027, we'll begin to hear that um, people want to see a new set of goals, which also uh, for, for the period we'll say 2030 to 2045. And of course, there are also new dimensions which were not covered in the SDGs. Uh, digital connectedness, for example, that that wasn't really brought out so clearly. Migration as, as a, a sort of a, a reality of uh, uh, sustainable development. That also, I mean, I'm picking those two at random. So there will be a case for refining and extending the agenda, perhaps. Um, uh, so I could see that happening. There'll be a new set of goals. Therefore, I'm not worried too much about whether uh, it'll all be done by 2030. Of officially, mm -hmm. of course, <laughs> we're all committed to that. But um, I should have added just in my earlier remarks, Orla, that um, it, this is the first time that the world has ever negotiated an agenda of this kind, because the Millennium Development Goals were simply written by a couple of UN experts and just announced that so they were never negotiated. Wow. Um, so this is the first time that we had to get all 193 countries into a, a room and they each had a veto over every comma of the text. So uh, um, and, and th that was quite a, a complex uh, situation. And the other thing is that this agenda applies to every country in the world. It's, I mean, it's universal. That is new. The Millennium Development Goals were geared at developing countries, but this is literally a universal agenda. So it means that Ireland is implementing the SDGs as much as the, U, uh, the US or Russia or China uh, or, or the Marshall Islands. That is totally new in the UN, and that's why the SDGs are quite uh, unique. And I think that's why there's still this enthusiasm. Uh, the smallest countries in the world depend on the SDGs, uh, depend on implementation. Even when Trump was there, he abandoned the Paris Agreement, as we know, for the US, but he didn't ever actually disown the SDGs. So they are the single uncontested global agenda, and that's something in today's world. Yeah. And, and David, just to follow up with that, um, kind of on my previous question, do you feel that damage has been done in terms of, you know, what we're seeing in this post-COVID period um, and the uneven rollout of vaccines? You I know, don't, if we need... sorry, on the, on the yeah. inequality aspect, yeah. I don't think that it is lasting damage. Before COVID, we already spotted that um, the problems of inequality were certainly not, were not getting better and, and in many cases getting worse. Often it's the inequality within a country, but the gap between rich and poor. So that was already visible um, for a number of reasons 
before COVID hit. And of course, it has been exacerbated by COVID. But I, I think what will happen is that we will gradually get on top of COVID and countries will um, sort of resume the effort to <clears throat> make progress towards the SDGs. I'm not saying that they'll be, they'll be achieved. Yeah. Inequality is, um, it is itself a, a, a goal. There are many uh, contributing factors. Conflict is one, the fact that we have a, um, an escalating number of conflicts in the world. Um, uh, we have displacement as a result. We have migration. You have, uh, you also have slow economic performance in some countries which has widened the gap that there isn't the transfer of resources from uh, from from rich to poor uh, as we had wanted uh, so i'm not underestimating the the challenge but i do think that in a few years time getting over the covid uh, um, uh, dilemmas we will make more progress towards the sdgs and towards combating uh, inequality mm. Great. Um, Paul, would you like to add anything to, to that? To that? Yeah. Um, so it's it's, uh, it, it's 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 clearly not COVID nineteen is not a good thing. Um, a, a lot of people have died, and it, it's a terrible thing. Um, but just you know, just to look for these these opportunities or what sort of um, things have changed because of COVID, right? And and I do think there's a couple of things that I think are quite interesting, right? So one is the role of science. This is just taking it from a university point of view, et cetera. Um, I could see now with the new common agenda that came out in the last General Assembly that the General Secretary is now insisting on the SAB. This is the Scientific Advisory Board to go back into his office. He's also wanting more um, science policy interface and more scientists involved, even actually at the Security Council level, right? Um, and I think we even saw that in our country that Back in the old days of the 50s, when Whitaker used to sit down with Loudon Ryan and, and Trinity and, and the professors in Queens and UCD and ask them advice over lunch um, and certainly come up with the capital program and the planning for, for Ireland, there was a very clear uh, respect for science, if you know, in a sense, and the role of academics and policy. I think that got very diluted and it didn't just get diluted in Ireland, it got diluted everywhere, right? Mm. So when COVID came, people turned to, uh, turn to science. Like they said, okay, what can we do here? They really were lost. And across a lot of the world, you do see uh, a big step forward of, of NEFET and, and you know, the, all the tracks and tracing and the, the testing and the vaccines, et cetera. Um, and people are able to associate that. This is a global issue. We're trying to get a global science response. And then they now can map that into, you know, climate change and biodiversity, ocean health, and all these other things where they can say, you know, this idea of science and, and, a, and a kind of a common pool of science and open science and transferring science across the world, like that actually, this is actually quite important, right? And the fact that it hasn't worked brilliantly because of the trips, the fact that COVAX, COVAX wasn't funded, the fact mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, it actually s s put a kind of a 3D scanner on all of that, where all of us now are thinking, we need to be more careful about our, into our, our property rights here. We need to be more careful that it is not just for the Northern Hemisphere, more careful that it's open and it's transferable. And if we are really to deal with all these uh, climate issues, which this is, you know, it's a zoonotic disease, which is a climate issue. Um, uh, I think there's learnings and I think there are bi big learnings. Um, the, the second thing is, is, of course, the failures of COVAX in a sense, you know, the nationalism around vaccines and the inequality and the rollout, and then a kind of an understanding because we did that, uh, you know, no one's safe till everyone's safe. And now we have, uh, you know, a new variant coming at us because we didn't actually roll out the vaccines in a kind of an equal way. Um, I think people are beginning to, to, to put this in, you know, it's the same with the way we combat climate. There is no point like China, Europe and, and the US going to climate neutrality and then letting industrialization rip in India and Africa and South America. I mean, you know, they're just going to create all the emissions that we save. So that's just not going to work, right? Um, the same with ocean health, the same with everything. So ironically, I think people are understanding the multilateral system better. They're, mm -hmm. they're kind of actually saying, um, you know, actually we do need to be in the same room. We do need dialogue. We do need cooperation. It is about interstate issues. Um, 
And, and of course, this is feeding into geopolitics as well. It's not just about the nice things here. I mean, obviously, we're trying to prevent militarization, securitization, and wars, and, and lots of all the other nasty things. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, ironically, I actually think COVID nineteen has injected a bit of pace into uh, into the SDG agenda and and the cops, and I actually think it's pushing multilateralism forward. Mm. Great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Paul. So, so if we if we say, you know, you raise an interesting point there that um, the importance of multilateralism and that regardless of how much you're contributing to, say, the um, global climate emissions or, um, you know, um, it's that we all, every nation has a has a role to play in implementing the sustainable development agenda um, and all dimensions of that. Um, so, David, I'll turn to you first. In how would you how would you rate Ireland's progress across the, um, our implementation of the SDGs and climate in particular? Sure. Orla, first of all, you know I'm I'm a private citizen nowadays. I don't represent the government anymore. But yes. uh, but yes. but but on the other hand, I'm trying to give a, an honest account. Um, perhaps the um, the best would be to uh, say what Ireland said about itself um, in, or to recall that um, in, in a report which they produced in 2018 as part of the, the SDG uh, monitoring uh, arrangements. And then I mentioned what civil society at the time felt was the case. Now, I mean, there'll be many different perspectives on this, um, but uh, Broadly speaking, uh, when Ireland produced its so-called voluntary national review, that's the term used, uh, kind of, a, it, it, it's a plan, or sorry, it's a report on our progress under each of the, of the headings. When we produced that, uh, it was presented to the UN in 2018, and from, from memory, um, we recognized, we, we felt that we were making progress on the health goal, education, growth and innovation. I'm picking those uh, in offhand. And that kind of makes sense as well. I mean, I think we would be generally perceived to be strong performers there. But um, the, the minister at the time presenting the, the uh, report acknowledged that, uh, you know, we were perhaps weaker in areas like sustainable consumption and production, um, uh, on protection of the marine, marine environment, on achieving full gender uh, equality, on the housing issue, no surprise, um, and on climate as it then was. Now, in fairness, in the meantime, the present government, as we know, has done an awful lot more on climate, and there's a very impressive climate action plan. But those, the things I just mentioned there were acknowledged by the government in a quiet way to be weaknesses at the time. There may be civil society groups who say there are a lot more weaknesses than that. And in the actual shadow report, which was done by civil society at the time, um, they felt that insufficient attention was being paid to what I'd call the, the leaving no one behind agenda, uh, um, insufficient attention at home. Uh, this slogan, leaving no one behind, uh, for which I have a certain responsibility, uh, it, it, it means addressing the needs of the most vulnerable, the most marginalized groups in society. And it became a kind of a catchphrase for part of, of the, the, the 2030 agenda. Um, so civil society felt that we should be doing more to address the most vulnerable groups in Ireland. And I so, certainly don't dissent from that. Um, and they also felt that um, uh, tax, uh, well, um, that the tax arrangements in Ireland uh, could be seen as tax evasion. Okay, and again, I, I won't comment on that. So, I, I, but apart from that, they more or less echoed what the minister himself had had said. So, in in the round order. I think Ireland will be an average kind of performer internationally. It's not achieving all the goals, but equally it's doing its best. It's making, and, and I think what was noticeable about the Irish presentation in 2018 was that we were giving an honest account. Mm. Many countries go in for a kind of a beauty contest approach where they'll say, we're doing the devil and all in, in, to implement uh, every conceivable STG. And it doesn't really make for the kind of um, honest peer uh, appraisal and peer review, which is at the bottom of the SDGs. I mean, that's how we want the SDGs to be implemented, that countries would feel under peer pressure within their own regions to move a bit, move forward more. Um, so um, uh, is many of the countries presenting have tended to accentuate their successes and ignore everything else. Ireland was at least honest in mm -hmm. uh, recognizing. So overall, a kind of a 
50 percent let's say 60 percent maybe um improved now by the climate plan mm -hmm. i'd have to say if they were now presenting and they will be presenting again in 2022 i think the climate plan should be seen honestly as a, a success provided we can show that uh, some, some progress <laughs> has actually been made in the meantime Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Paul, would you agree uh, uh, at 50% warts and all kind of evaluation of... <laughs> Perhaps it's a bit more, a bit more. <laughs> a bit more, <laughs> yes, good. Yeah, um, um, so my kind of perspective on this is that um, Andrew Jackson will be giving us uh, a talk later on in these conversations, and he was the solicitor uh, who represented the Friends of the Earth, I think they're called, in the, in the civil society's action case against the government, for not actually having an appropriate uh, climate action mitigation plan for the um, for the Paris Agreement, and they won. They went. They, they went. They, they they won that case, and and I actually and Eamon Ryan, to be fair to him, was at every one of those uh, court cases, and I'm sure he was very positive. But uh, a lot of people see this new climate action plan, and they see the detail in it and the timelines and what each sector has to do. But that actually came because of a, jur a jury seat. That came because the, the legislators or the TDs or the Oireachtas was told <laughs> by the judges that they have to do this uh, because of a court case. And, and of course, Andrew is gathering students all over the world to take similar cases in different countries to do this. And I kind of find this quite interesting because it's like the legislator, like normally there's a separation of powers, right? So for the jury to put pressure on the legislators to do this properly was great. Um, and that's why we have this climate action plan. And it, and it is good that the climate action plan to actually be implemented more or less means the SDGs have to be implemented. Um, but it is a bit back to front, right? Because um, my feeling is we haven't redone our sustainable, our, our sustainable development plan. We had a plan, I think, from 2018 to 2020, which is not redone by the Department of Environment. Um, the stakeholder forums have stopped. There, was a, there, is, there was a very short consultative process for the new VNR in 2022. Um, so I think the bureaucratic side of government in some ways have actually dropped the ball quite seriously here, right? So. The, the actual legislators have not, um, the jurists have not. I think the security side, the military, like the Higgins and even the defense forces are taking on this, you know, for peacekeeping, et cetera, taking this very, very seriously. Um, but I do think, you know, and this, this means academics, so civil society, academics and, and corporates in Ireland really have to sit down with the departments and get those stakeholder forums back up and running really have you know a new plan uh for for you know going forward and um to do a good job for the vnrs you know what i mean because i think we've done a great job on the climate action plan and i think you know that is going forward meaning we will be good at the sdgs do you know what i mean yeah um, but uh, i, I kind of think it came back to front but i was a bit of a groupie for andrew and his team you know so uh, all kudos yeah. to them uh, putting pressure on the legis on, on the jury who put pressure on the legislator to make progress on this actually you know mm. yeah. yeah that that's that's um a great point about the role of kind of all dimensions and structures within society who have a role to play to kind of drive this agenda uh forward um and i i i, I looked at some of the questions in the chat you know while you were speaking as well and and what people were you know some people were asking is what is the role of universities you know we see andrew and his team um as as one example a positive example of of um academics um in various capacities getting involved to drive this agenda forward um i'll start with you paul on that how do you feel that that universities can best mobilize to to hold countries to account for their targets yeah, so not to, um, I mean, it was mentioned by Taz that, you know, we have a strategic plan in UCD where we have an S, you know, STEM development plan and we could go through all the different activities. But just to be more general about it, so there's kind of three levels that I think universities have to work on. The first one is that when we do our education research and policy outreach and innovation, um, we have to, to, are we actually doing research for the public good? Like, are we actually researching on social, uh, you know, like for sustainable economies, societies, governance and, and uh, environments? You know what I mean? Uh, because, you know, there is funding coming in dictated, you know, by different funders 
and 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 it's not clear to me that that's always a hundred percent for the public good or for the global public good in general, right? Um, so that's one issue, um, and of course the SDGs are great for that. They give us that kind of guidebook in a sense to say, well, are we studying the right issues? The second thing is that are we creating a global uh, science commons that is open, right? Um, so what I mean by this is that there's no point us working with the likes of Pfizer, you know, creating a vaccine that nobody can copy or nobody can replicate around. And this is going on with all our research, right? So I think, you know, we have to have a big rethink, even with publishing with Elsevier, et cetera, even with these rankings, we've got to go, what we do, because at the end of the day, we want to get it to the legislators. We want it to actually have an impact on society and on the quality of the global environment and, and you know, on e economics, et cetera. So we have, the way to do that is to have uh, open science, right? And also to create open science platforms so people can access this. And we also uh, have to make an effort to disseminate this type of work into the Iraq. So for when you see somebody like Senator Higgins, who I think is marvelous. So what rather than us spending time creating metadata and effort, giving it to the Times Higher Education or something like that, you know, we should be making effort to disseminate our work and data and science to help her in her arguments on trying to get, you know, the set the the Senate, the Shannon and, and the doll going on, on the SDGs. You know, and we could do this, you know, we and, and it's just reallocating resources. And then the last point I'll make is that Having science in the top 100 universities isn't enough. It'll never be enough, right? We've got to make sure that we are not doing this project. If we are not, and UCD is quite good at this in different dimensions, but if we're not building capacity in the least developed countries or in the developing world, in, in what I'm called science and the, the universities and education and, and research, we are not doing our job here. Um, and, uh, and, and this is kind of true for governments and corporates as well, like it's it's not good enough just to be doing it in the global or in the global north or at home or in, in Europe, right? We've got to be building capacities in the global south. And and you have to have that focus. You have to purposely say, is our education and research and policy actually having an impact on the global south? And are we developing capacities them? And we do, we have joint PhDs, we have like we but UCD volunteers overseas, but like we do that a little bit, but it's not mainstreamed, and it's certainly not mainstreamed in the Northern Hemisphere. So, so basically, you know, is is there virtue in your in your? In other words, are you SDG orientated in all the things you do in your research, education, and policy? Is it open? Can it be used by everyone? Can it be transferred to who want to use it? And are you making an effort to actually uh, build capacity in in the global south in any direction or any way? Um, and I think that's how universities can move forward on this agenda. Yeah, some some really, really great uh, food for thought for, for all of us here. Um, and in some ways, uh, Paul, what, what you're saying kind of speaks to one of the SDGs themselves, which calls for strong institutions, you know, and if we understand our, um, the education system, you know, largely as a social institution and UCD maybe as an individual manifestation of that. Um, but, but that but, SDG but that 16 SDG. also has a, um, also includes, it calls for peace, justice and strong institutions. Um, so I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit back to you, David, to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, we know that that you were involved um, in, in peace negotiations and it sounds like you brought many of those skills to bear on the, um, in the drafting of the SDGs um, process. So I guess, um, Kind of thinking about how we move forward for the next round and how we kind of build back better and, and how we move forward with this agenda. Um, do you have any lessons or reflections of, of what skills and um, both as kind of individuals and uh, in, in, in our professional context and this broader SDG context of how that kind of peace building helped you and, and what some lessons that we might take forward from that? I think you're on mute, David, there, sorry. Um, there you go. I, I, I'll come back to the, the the sort of Northern Ireland aspect in a moment, uh, the peace process, but ju just on the goal itself, or the one you referred to, SDG 16, it was the most controversial of them all. In other words, uh, many developing countries were uneasy about such a goal being included, and I'll explain why. Because in a development agenda, it's not automatic that you would have a peace uh, uh, dimension, let's say. Countries in the global north um, and I'm simplifying this a, a, a lot, 
feel that uh, you, you need to try to create peaceful, inclusive and transparent societies uh, as part of a development agenda. Developing countries frequently fear that that's just a code for uh, rewarding countries which have peace and punishing those who do, who have conflict. In other words, they fear that, um, I don't want to name countries, but a, a particular country which has long-standing conflict within its borders may fear that if peace becomes part of a development agenda, that it will lose out. So we had to overcome these suspicions, and the result and the result is is goal sixteen. And in the summary for the entire SDGs, the five P's, we managed. And I, I came up with those five P's. But peace, happily, is, is there as well. But many countries, as I say, resisted that. So, um, but I think nevertheless, what it is what is agreed is that. Uh, we we want to create societies which are are at peace with themselves, where development can take hold and, and be more effective. That you can't really get sustainable development without peace. That the two are bound together. Um, and th that also raises issues about democratic institutions, about the rule of law, about fighting corruption, about uh, having good governance. So a whole set of uh, desirables were included in this goal 16 and with some reluctance the developing countries went along with it. Um, um, some people argue that it's even the most, the single most important goal. I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, we don't prioritize any of them by the way, um, uh, they're all equally equally important. Um, others say that the number 17 which is all about partnerships is, is the more important one but uh, they, certainly, it was the most difficult one to, to agree, the, 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 the peace one. As to how the Northern Ireland peace process might have influenced uh, those, those drafting it, and, and I, I was by no means the, I mean, I was involved a little bit, but not, not centrally in, in the framing of, of that goal. It is possible that things like uh, creating a peaceful and inclusive society, that, that came from the Northern Ireland peace process. It's possible that that was on the minds of several people, not, not, not just me. Um, uh, certainly access to justice, uh, having accountable institutions, that kind of language is in the Good Friday Agreement. But in fairness, I don't think that I had a, a copy of the Good Friday Agreement beside me as I was uh, contributing to the UN negotiations. But I think it would have been consciously or subconsciously there for a number of negotiators um, and I mean the Good Friday Agreement is actually regarded as a kind of a, a, a textbook example of conflict resolution. It's about the only really successful example of conflict resolution in the world. So many people at the UN know about the, the Good Friday Agreement because of that almost unique status. Um, human, the idea of participatory uh, uh, institutions as well, uh, um, that was in the Good Friday Agreement, that is in uh, in Goal 16 as well. Um, so, uh, and I'm, you know, the Secretary General uh, uh, of the UN has launched a new uh, so-called common agenda, which is really meant to point the way for the UN generally over the next few years, and it, uh, it talks about uh, sort of the world after COVID, really, but 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 the need for an ever stronger and more inclusive uh, sort of world politics, more inclusive uh, um, multilateralism. I think those are points which uh, are are part of the. Uh, the, the, the Northern Ireland peace process uh, succeeded primarily because it brought in every possible uh, point of view. It, it was a very broad church and uh, we found principles that we could all agree on. That's the same approach with the SDGs. We, we, we tried to have a framework which uh, every country in the world can sign up to. I, 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 now, you know it's not legally binding. I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is legally binding. The SDGs are, I don't like to use the word aspirational, but they are kind of politically binding. They're not, there's no legal sanction if a country uh, is unable to achieve them uh, on time, but they have a strong moral force. There's, there's no doubt about that, a political and moral force. And uh, uh, I'd like to think that the Good Friday Agreement indirectly contributed to that.
Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, David. So I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of our time. I just want to pick up on one last question that came in in the q and I've tried to kind of um, weave them in throughout. Um, and, and Paul, I'll start with you. And, and the question is, what can individuals do to support the STG agenda? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's my background that I've generally worked, you know, for government, you know, and, and kind of government-based, intergovernment-based organizations. So, you know, I am kind of of the view that we do need system change. Like, you know, there, there is no doubt it's, it's very hard for an individual to change that when you need system change, right? But what I would say is that once you kind of know that, you know, like once you kind of know, uh, it's then as an individual, you know, you could say, I need to understand how corporates are, like, you can influence corporates, you can influence a lot of fears in your life, the political, who you vote for. Um, you know, we're all in society, we're all um, in our workplaces, we are all political actors in a sense, and we can all make the right decisions and it matters. But to kind of understand, just like maybe Friends of the Environment did, like this is just a small group of people, but they could, they understand that they wanted system change, like they're actually fighting for our constitution to have recognition of environmental rights, you know, like the Human Rights Com Commission have actually come up with, you know what I mean? And they know, you know, a few people can do this, you know what I mean? And they can have a campaign and get people behind them and et cetera, et cetera. So I think if people understand that they can have power, you know, by coordinating with people, it's like inside UCD, the academics, if they can coordinate, if they want something, there can be a bottom up swell for change and it can change, of course it can. Political systems can change. Uh, corporates can change in their in their focus and their planning, etc. If their workforces and their buyers and their boards, etc., want e ESG models, etc. So, what I'd kind of say to people is to recognise what the system is and where there's these blockages or issues in the system that groups of individuals can attack without mercy, mm. right? And they can change things. Um, so. I'm, I'm not disempowering people, you know, like, so basically, you know, what I like to see in people, um, you know, is to be leaders for change, and particularly people in privileged position in universities and in university alumni and students to be that. Um, so obviously to save water, to, to reduce your carbon print, to get an electric car, I mean, all this is good, uh, but I think really, I'd like to see leaders looking at these kind of bottlenecks or places where you can see that change and reform is needed and with like-minded people, you know, attack it and, and, and change it. You know? Nice. Pick your issue and attack it. I like that <laughs> message um, to, to wrap up. David, would you like to add anything about how, you know, individuals can bring the SDGs into their daily lives or um, kind of individual action in general? Sure. Um, uh, it, um, I mean, the first challenge is to increase public awareness of the SDGs uh, in all countries. Um, in some countries, more progress has made, been made than in others. Um, uh, I think we, we have a government here which is uh, genuinely enthusiastic about the SDGs, um, but they still need to communicate the importance of them across the government system. Uh, um, the, you know, the, 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 the integration aspect, which Paul has referred to, needs to be brought out more clearly. Um, uh, the, I think individuals, um, let's say beginning with schools, school children, um, I think in many countries are being given uh, a lot of information about the SDGs, but they still they need to absorb them into their daily lives as they become adults. I mean, this is an agenda for them. It is ultimately about their world, and and uh, we try to bring that out in the in the uh, agenda. So. First, public awareness. Um, secondly, there are there are all kinds of initiatives that can be taken at local level uh, to highlight one particular aspect of the SDGs or one particular way in which goals can can be uh, can be um, uh, advanced. Um, and we, in designing this framework, we always had in mind that there would be community uh, level involvement uh, all around the world. It, it was never going to be done. By governments alone, uh, or even by governments mainly, uh, it was always going to require a whole of society approach. So, um, but you'd be amazed how many initiatives actually do exist around the world. Uh, it might be that 
you know, I'm just inventing this, but let's, it, it might be that there is a particular partnership to promote primary education in a province of South Africa. Well, that would be an, in, in, to implement the SDGs. And that partnership might involve some local communities, it might involve uh, foundations, it might involve UN agencies, the private sector. Uh, partnership is a very flexible term, but it's meant to be the vehicle through which we implement the SDGs. But lastly, private private citizens can do the kind of things Paul was talking about, can, can uh, um, change their own daily practices so that they promote sustainability. They can show that they are committed to the Climate Action Plan, to the SDGs. This little badge that both Paul and I are wearing is, is kind of a worldwide symbol of devotion to the SDGs and a surprising number of people are actually wear it. <laughs> and uh, um, the, so, so really beginning in schools and moving on to, um, uh, to sort of government emphasizing the importance of uh, uh, of, of making progress towards the SDGs across all areas of government. I mean, there is a there's a kind of a national action plan, national implementation plan in each country, and that needs to be refreshed. Certainly in Ireland, I agree with everything that Paul was saying. Civil society here has been very strongly in support, uh, has been backing the SDGs, and their role needs to be uh, amplified and and. Uh, given a kind of a platform uh, and I'm sorry that the stakeholder platform doesn't appear to, uh, to be active anymore. A few years ago it was active so there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in this country and after all we allow space for civil society. Other mm -hmm. countries around the world are, are, are more uh, defensive so uh, we need to be setting the example. It's a somewhat roundabout way of answering your question Orla but no, individual, no. I think schools programs are the most important. Great. Yeah. Great, yeah. Lots of examples, Lots of, examples of, community of community initiatives. Even I know UCD is partnered with SDG Dundrum, Dundrum 2030, Absolutely. where even locally in yeah. um, South Dublin, that, that uh, kind of bringing the SDGs down to a local and community level. Yeah. And we know that ownership yeah. is so important for, for the you know, longevity of, of these goals. And, you know, it's, it's our agenda at the end of the day. Um, OK, well, thank you both so much. I'm conscious of time. Taz, I, I think maybe you might want to come in and say thank you to everybody. Um, but that's been, I've really enjoyed our talk. So thank you both very much. Thank you, Anna. Pleasure. That's fantastic. Yes, thank you very much indeed, all of David and Paul, for such an enlightening conversation and particularly those fascinating behind the scenes insights into the really excellent open discursive process of establishing the goals and the, and the challenges and solutions involved and to me that's such a key to the, the to their kind of success and the buy-in that there is around the world yeah. that they were kind of co-created in that way I think, I think that's really a fantastic right. step forward and um, to me the discussion and the input by the chat and the, and the Q&A was, was very much a story of how we absolutely need a, a multilateral approach to these most important challenges of our time, that we need to work together to address them and that we need to do so with a very substantial and interlinked set of initiatives at, at all levels. We didn't really even get into that kind of conversation around things you do in, in relation to one goal have consequences for the others and, and the challenge of trying That's to right. make it all hang, hang together. Um, and, and those initiatives really have to be driven by individuals, communities, nations, and the United Nations, so across all those levels and all aspects of society and human activity. And I think that, you know, that it's clear that this requires resourcing and a, and a, and a conscious effort, and, and also that it should be informed by the best available information and insight from, I'd say not just science, but combinations of the wide range of academic disciplines here at UCD and at institutions all around the world, um, and from extensive dialogue with and throughout society. So, you know, and I, I think, you know, I, I also like the kind of acceptance that we might not quite reach the stated targets by 2030, <laughs> um, but that there are important steps towards them that we must take and, and that are certainly achievable through concerted action. And, and those steps will significantly improve the prospects for a better future for the planet and for all of the people on it. I, I, I think that central principle of leave no one behind is, is so important to, to the whole process. So, so thank you so much for your time and, and, and insights and thank you everyone for, for tuning in to listen today. Um, so a recording of the event is going to be available tomorrow on, on the YouTube channel along with our other episodes in this
series. And so just before I, I wrap up, um, I just want to let you know that I'll be back next week with the 2019 UCD Alumni Award winner in Research, Innovation and Impact is John Bell, who is the Director of Healthy Planet in DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. So very influential in the European context mm -hmm. in this respect. Um, so we'll also be joined by Saev O'Neill, who's a lecturer in climate policy and the former mm -hmm. policy coordinator for the Stop Climate Chaos Coalition. And, and the conversation is going to be led, as, as Paul said, by Andrew Jackson, who's an environmental and planning lawyer in the UCD Sutherland School of Law, uh, who led the climate case in 2020, referred to by Paul, which actually required the government to revise its national climate policy in light of its legal obligations. So really should be a fascinating conversation next week as well. Uh, so thanks again. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And I hope to see you again next week. Thank you very much.